Where does your passion for economics come from? I got interested in economics in college, and it was because I was, didn't know what I wanted to do. I was looking at all different fields, physics and literature and history. And the thing about economics was that it sort of combined all of the dimensions of, of the arts and sciences. It was quantitative and statistical, but it was also sociological, because it was about dealing with people and society. And, and I was also very interested in history. So a lot of my economics work has been economic history, for example, about the Great Depression. Um, so it was really a compromise among a, a whole different set of interests uh, that uh, got me into economics. What are the key implications of your research? Well, some of the most uh, uh, destructive uh, things that can happen to an economy is if you have a major financial crisis. Uh, that happened in the 1930s, that happened in 2008, and we know that that can have tremendously bad effects on the regular economy, average people's living standards. Um, and what I've tried to do in my work is uh, understand First of all, why financial crises happen, what, what kinds of things uh, cause a financial crisis, and what is the relationship between a crisis and the ordinary economy. And uh, my work is about uh, understanding that link and showing that link. Uh, and one of the implications of it is that it's, that it's very important to have a strong, stable uh, financial system uh, that will not collapse you know, when there's some kind of stress. So that's the most important, I think, uh, implication. How do you maintain your curiosity? Well, my curiosity, I think it's, it's natural. I mean, I've, I always thought history was fascinating. I think economics has a lot of challenging problems in it uh, from a sort of a problem solving or mathematical point of view, but it also has a lot to do with uh, society and almost any question you can think of in society from uh, the structure of families to the organization of, uh, of monetary policy, for example, can be studied with economics. And so if you get a little bit tired of one area, you can always, you can always shift to something else. So I think it's a, it's a very rich field because it does contain so many different um, types of questions that you, can, that you can study. Was there a particular person who influenced you? Yes, I had two very important mentors. Uh, when I was an undergraduate in college, I didn't really know for sure what I wanted to do. Um, and I walked into the office of a professor named Dale Jorgensen, who was a senior professor, and I was a lowly undergraduate. And I asked him if I could have a summer job. And he gave me one, which was very surprising. And I worked with him uh, on uh, research he was doing on the effects of energy price increases on the economy. This was the 1970s, and of course we see that today as well. And I, I ran computer programs for him. I used uh, punch cards that went into the, into the computer and studied the model that he had constructed and so on. And he was my advisor for the rest of college. Um, my first professional article was, uh, was co-authored with him, and, and he was been very supportive uh, throughout my entire career. And then he recommended, even though he was a Harvard professor, which is where I went to college, he recommended that I go to MIT for graduate school because at that time, in the, in the, in the 1970s, MIT was the best graduate program in the world. And I went to MIT immediately from college. And um, once again, although I knew I wanted to do economics, I didn't know, you know what field, what part of economics would I be interested in. And I spoke to a professor named Stanley Fisher um, who was a macroeconomist or monetary economist, and asked him, you know, should I, should I write my thesis in monetary economics? And he gave me a book by Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz called A Monetary History of the United States, where they tried to explain the relationship between the money supply and the economy, looking at 100 years of U.S. history. And Fisher said, read this. If it puts you to sleep, then do something else. If you think it's really interesting, then you should consider monetary economics. And I read the book, and I was, just thought it was really interesting. And I, uh, so I majored, I focused on econo macroeconomics and monetary economics. Fisher was my advisor. Uh, and again, I had, have had contact with him all the rest of my career. He went on to government like I did. I went into, um, into monetary policy making. Fisher became the governor of the Bank of Israel. 
And then he became the vice chair of the Federal Reserve, so being one of the very rare people who has served high in the government in two different countries. Uh, but he uh, was also very influential. So these two people, uh, Dale Jorgensen at Harvard and Stanley Fisher at MIT, did a lot to shape my uh, interest, my career, and have been great advisors you know, throughout my entire career. How do you cope with failure? Well, uh, I think you have to look ahead and say, you know, that not everything works. Um, uh, if, uh, if, if a certain project doesn't work out and you, you don't get a publication out of it or the, or the results are not what you hoped, uh, maybe you learn something from that. Maybe you can see a new problem. You know, why, why did it fail? And maybe that gives you some uh, insight into where your next step ought to be. Or maybe you just, uh, you're just barking up the wrong tree, as they say in English. Maybe uh, this, the question is not a good question. Maybe you need to rephrase it in a different way. So, you know, the, it's uh, many scientists and economists as well say that a failure could be the seed of, of a new project or a new idea. And uh, it's important. Uh, first, at first, you're disappointed. You know, you feel bad about you put all so much work into something and it didn't work out. But uh, if you learn something from it or you get a new idea from it, then, then it's, uh, you know, it, it's worthwhile. How do you move past failures and disappointments in your work? Well, again, you have to, to look forward. Um, uh, everyone, even the most accomplished scientists or politicians or writers, whatever, are going to have... Uh, failed attempts, you know, even great novelists throw away a, a manuscript or, or a painter would throw away a, uh, a, a portrait because it wasn't up to his or her standards. So again, I think it's important to, to try to learn from what, what went wrong, to ask the, if you're looking at the right question, um, and then, you know, to keep your eye on the future because the past is the past. You had success, you had failure. But uh, what matters is where you're going from, from this point. Uh, and so I think that's probably the best way to deal with failure. Everyone has to deal with failure. And you recognize that you're not special, you're not different. Uh, you have to deal with that as well. What advice would you give to a student or young researcher? For researchers specifically, research is driven by curiosity and, and interest and a desire to know, to understand a certain question. So if you really enjoy working on uh, a certain topic or reading about a certain area, that's a very important consideration. You, 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 researchers work many long hours. Many, often they are uh, uh, doing things that by themselves are kind of dull because they're part of a bigger project. So if you're not motivated by the question, if you're not really interested in, in what you're studying, then it's impossible to do. So you really have to uh, find something that uh, makes you excited and interested to, to, to learn more about. And you, and you see an opportunity to, to learn something that nobody else has done before. And that's, that's very, very important to do research. Uh, you know, more generally, um, I think that both for researchers and for people in other fields as well, it's a combination of what you're interested in. And they always say in college graduation speeches, is you should follow your passion. And that's true. You should follow something that, that excites you and interests you and so on. But you should also think about what, look at yourself and say, what, 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 do, what am I good at? What can I do better than other people? What, where can I improve myself? Uh, because uh, I could, I, I love baseball, but I could never be a, a great baseball player because I don't have that talent. So uh, if I tried to be a baseball player, it would be very frustrating. So uh, it's important to be both uh, interested and excited about the thing you're working on, but also to feel that you, you have uh, the potential to do good work, whether it's in science or whether it's in uh, business or wherever it might be. And the combination is what makes for uh, success. Can you tell me a bit more about your childhood and teenage years and how this influenced your interest in economics? Well, um, I spent my childhood and teenage years in a small town in South Carolina named Dillon. Um, so I went to public schools and, and uh, 
Uh, my father was a, uh, the pharmacist, the town, the town pharmacist in, in, in Dillon. So I had a, a fairly small town, ordinary uh, uh, childhood. Um, it, was, uh, it was the 1960s, and in South Carolina in the 1960s, there was a lot of racial discrimination. People, uh, white people and black people couldn't drink from the same uh, water fountain or couldn't go to the same schools and so on. And so that was uh, part of my life growing up. And, and uh, it was a good thing that I, that I had uh, some black friends, one in particular who helped me get into Harvard and become, put me on my course to a successful uh, academic career. I think um, one thing I learned in, in uh, Dillon uh, was uh, that people work really hard to put food on the table for their family. I, I worked uh, in Dillon. I worked as a construction worker for one summer. I was a waiter on tables. I worked in my father's drugstore. Working in the drugstore wasn't so hard, but the construction work and waiting on tables was very difficult. And, and the, you know, the pay wasn't that high. And you know, it impressed me that um, uh, to uh, earn enough money, if you're not highly educated, to earn enough money to um, make sure your children can go to school and that there's enough food and so on, uh, is a lot, it's very hard. You have to work very hard. And so when I became a policymaker, an economic policymaker and an economist, I think it was very important to, when you're looking at the numbers, you know, how many people lost their job or how big is the inflation rate, it's important to remember that there are real people behind the numbers, that, uh, that uh, when unemployment goes up, there are real people who lose their job and that makes a big difference for their ability to, to um, uh, put food on the table, as I said. So uh, I think that was an important thing, living in a, in a, in a small town, uh, not very rich town at all, um, uh, gave me some appreciation of uh, how hard people have to work uh, to uh, uh, earn enough money to, to support their family. Do you have advice for young people with a similar background who might want to follow a similar path to you? It depends what they really what they want to do. Um, the path I took, I was fortunate that I was able to go to uh, some very good universities. I went to Harvard and MIT and, and so on. And that gave me a, a good start, obviously. I worked with some very good professors and so on. Uh, but I don't want to give the impression that you, you can't be a successful academic or, or, or a business person, whatever you want to do, only if you go to, to the very top universities. Uh, there are very many good schools, colleges around the country. Um, and uh, if you are, what's more important than the name of the, on the school is the professors you work with and your own dedication, your own uh, willingness to work hard. Um, so while I think that getting, going to a good school and, uh, is, is important, uh, it's mo more important is what you do there and who you work with and what you learn. So uh, that, I think that's an important uh, consideration. Does this college or the university match my interests? Do I have the ability to, and, the, and the interest to, to really make use of what the school has to offer? And I think you can get a really good education in a lot of places. And uh, it's more about the student than it is about the college. What skills do you need to succeed as a researcher and policymaker? How can young students develop these skills? There were close links between my research and my policymaking experience. As I said, when I was a researcher, I studied history, I studied the Great Depression, I studied financial crises. And as a policymaker, I had to deal with some of these same problems. I was uh, in the government, I was the Federal Reserve Chair during the financial crisis in uh, 2008. And while, of course, there were many problems that were not anticipated, um, certainly some of the things I learned by studying earlier episodes helped me, uh, helped me uh, think about it. More generally, I think, uh, you know, some of the ability to, uh, to analyze, to see what's in common between two different kinds of situations, um, to think logically, uh, those are skills that help, you know, in almost any profession and certainly uh, I took to my policymaking a lot of what I had learned and a lot of the skills I had learned um, as an academic. There, there's some people 
you know, this, for, it's not often the case, not always the case, that academic can move smoothly into policymaking because they're very different in some ways. Policymaking in, involves a lot more uh, people skills because you have to deal with the political side, you have to work with colleagues in the institution and so on. As an academic, you can stay uh, in your own laboratory and, and work by yourself. But uh, if you can make that transition, I think the, the analytical skills and the knowledge you gain as a researcher uh, if it's appropriate, can really work to help you be more uh, effective uh, in a policymaking uh, role. What skills are important for students or researchers to develop? Every single fact that you learn in school or college will someday probably be outdated. So the only way to uh, continue to be at uh, to be effective and to be at the forefront of your field, whatever that might be, is to learn how to learn, how to think analytically, how to be critical, how to understand uh, whether uh, someone's statement is, is true or, or can be verified. So I, in general, the ability to, to learn and to think analytically is much more important than learning a set of facts because the, the, the world is always changing. The demands uh, on your uh, abilities is always changing, so you have to have the kind of skill that lets you adapt to new situations. Do you think it's important to revisit or reanalyze subjects that people may have studied a lot already? I studied the Depression, first of all, because I just thought it was incredibly interesting. Uh, I, I had thought about that uh, even back to my childhood. I had heard some stories from my grandmother about their life in the Depression, and, and it struck me as being such a uh, a strange situation that the economy just stopped working in a way. So, so why did that happen? So uh, I think that the Depression was, had been studied, of course, but I didn't think it had been solved by any means. I thought that we still needed to learn a lot. And I wanted to um, uh, contribute to that effort. And I think that since I wrote this paper 40 years ago, not just because of my efforts, but because of other people as well, that economists know a lot more now about the Depression than they did uh, 40 years ago. And of course, it was an incredibly important event, not just because it helped shape the 20th century, but because it f foreshadowed, you know, some of the problems that we've had uh, in, in the world uh, since then. So um, I think that, you know, th there was a lot to do and, and uh, I was glad to be able to contribute to understanding that, that episode. In recent years, a lot more organisations have begun investing in the environmental, social and governance ESG movement. Is it important to invest in climate conscious actions? Do you think we'll see more of these in the future? Well, I think it's important for people who are taking uh, investment decisions or business decisions uh, to think about the impact on the environment, you know, on, on society and so on. I do think it's also important to make sure that you know, that you're not just putting the name on it, that you really, you, you really have to spend some effort to, um, to make sure that you're, what you're doing really and truly is helping and it's not just, you know, uh, for show. The very wealthy people who give their money to, to, uh, to philanthropy say, giving away money in a, effectively is harder than er earning it. Uh, because you, if you really want to be effective, you've got to learn about the, the types of, of uh, efforts, the types of needs that there are, and make sure that your money uh, is, is, is working effectively to help you know, improve the situation. So uh, while I do think that uh, investment and um, business decisions should take into account environmental, social, and other considerations, I think it's not so easy to make sure that you're really being effective and that that's a big part of, of that kind of uh, uh, investing. Can you tell us about the object that you're donating to the Nobel Prize Museum? I brought a, um, a copy of my memoir when I left the Federal Reserve in 2014. Uh, I'd been in the government for 12 years, um, almost, and I'd seen a lot of uh, difficult situations ranging from the housing bubble to the financial crisis to the Great Recession. Uh, I had spent uh, a lot of time testifying before Congress and and uh, talking to the broader public, and I thought I wanted to tell you know my story, and so I wrote a memoir about uh, the time, mostly about my time in government. I talked a bit about some of the earlier 
parts of my life as well. And so that's the book is what I gave uh, to, the, to the museum because I think it's important to recognize uh, that uh, you can take what you learn in an academics or scientific context and not everyone can do it, but, it, but it's, it's great if you can take that and bring it to application, whether it's to a, a, a new uh, industry, uh, a new product, or to governmental service. And, and I hope my, uh, my memoir, well, at least from my personal point of view, talks about uh, how I took what I had learned and, and applied it in a, in a very difficult uh, economic uh, situation. How does it feel going back to academic research after so long as a policymaker? Well, it's uh, it's quite different. Um, I find that my research has changed some. When I was younger, I was doing you know mostly very technical research, uh, more narrowly focused, uh, as young researchers tend to do. Uh, now that I've had both the academic experience but also the public policy experience in Washington. Uh, a lot of my work has been sort of more uh, broader based and more about broader issues. But I've continued to do more technical research as well. I think it's important uh, to keep uh, abreast of new methodologies and think what's happening in the field. So uh, I've enjoyed it, you know, and it's nice to have the pressure off because I, I don't have to meet some kind of, you know, publish or perish type of standard. I can write what I want to write about. And I, I write a mixture of, of uh, uh, sort of more books or, or aimed at more at the broader public, like my memoir, for example. And I also write uh, technical articles uh, that are aimed for um, research journals. So uh, it's, it's been an enjoyable transition. And I can spend, you know, I can work as quickly or slowly as I like. And, and it's, been, it's been a good experience. Do you think it's important to have hobbies outside of your research? Well, it's important to keep your mind and, uh, and your interests uh, alive and alert. Um, some scientists work very many hours uh, and they're very, very focused on what they're trying to do, which of course is how you win a Nobel Prize, I guess. Um, and they don't have a lot of time, but I think it's good for your mental health and for your having a more balanced life and. Uh, and even for your creativity and your uh, ability to be effective in solving problems, if you have some things outside of, of work, you know, that give you a more balanced uh, experience, including, I think, physical activities, cultural activities, uh, reading about other fields and so on. Uh, so I do think that's important, recognizing that there are some people who are so focus that they work very, very many hours. When I was a, uh, an academic, I worked long hours, but I, I never spent all my time on my research. I, I always tried to mix in other activities, very different activities as well, because I thought it made me uh, healthier and, and actually better able to do the work because I wasn't so, um, uh, so narrowly focused on, 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 that, on that research. If you could give someone one piece of advice, what would that advice be? I think that, uh, first of all, that you, you need to think um, about developing your, your thinking skills, your analytical skills, recognizing that the issues and, and, and uh, problems that you're going to be dealing with over your life, whether they're scientific problems or personal problems or whatever they may be, require the ability to analyze, to logically dissect a problem and figure out what's the best approach. So analytical thinking, I think, uh, is really essential. And then to be successful in a field, I think it's important to combine uh, both uh, the passion, both the interest, in, intrinsic interest in, in the area, whether it's, it's a, a scientific area or whether it's a uh, uh, an activity like uh, a professional activity like medicine or being a, a business person or whatever you might, a lawyer, or whatever you might be interested in doing, but you need to combine that intrinsic interest uh, that makes you, motivates you to, to do it with a sense that you do have uh, a set of skills that you can either, that you have or you can develop that you can make yourself feel successful and, and, and uh, uh, pro make progress in that, in that area. I think that's important that you have both the passion and the feeling that you've got the necessary uh, talents that will get you uh, where you want to go. 
People often look for mentors when developing their skills. Do you think there's a certain way to identify and find a mentor? Well, there's usually um, a group of a logical group of people that you could look at if you're uh, uh, if you're in a uh, starting lawyer, for example, there are going to be some young partners in the law firm that would be a logical place to look. Or if you're uh, a young professor in a university, there'll be some, uh, again, younger, probably uh, uh, professors who have been there for a while who can be helpful. So I, I think you want to look at people who are, broadly speaking, in your same area of interest, but have had more experience and know both how to uh, uh, solve either research problems or professional problems, whatever they might be, but also can give you a few hints about how to shape your career, how to make, how to get promoted, how to move ahead, uh, how to find interesting problems to work on, uh, what kinds of job you should take when the opportunities arise. So I think it is important to have uh, mentors. You could have one mentor who, who uh, is really important in your life for a long period of time, or you could just have a group of people who, you know, you talk about, you, you go to that one person for a certain type of problem and another person for another type of problem. But uh, all of us, you know, whatever we're doing, uh, look to the generation above us, the older people who have had more experience, uh, to help give us the benefit of that experience. When you're approaching a problem that you know is going to be difficult, how do you tackle that problem? It depends what we're talking about. If we're talking about an academic issue, um, one thing I would do is, is try to learn as much as I can about how other people have solved similar problems. So I would look at um, you know, the, the, the research literature and, and see what kinds of approaches have been used. And then I would try to think about what is it that uh, is deficient about those approaches? Where, where do they go wrong? Where, are they sh where do they fall short? Uh, and can I think of a different way to approach the same problem? But, you know, I don't think about it as approaching a really difficult problem. I, I, I try to think about it as looking at different parts of a problem and in each case trying to figure out uh, sort of the underlying intuition. What is it that makes sense to me? Um, for example, my research that was cited by the Nobel Prize Committee was about uh, the effects of the collapse of the financial system on the Great Depression. And working on that required looking at lots of different literatures and doing reading a lot of history and so on. But the basic idea that if the banking system fails and everybody is going bankrupt, that that's going to hurt the economy, that's not such a difficult thing to, to come up with. And so that motivated me to think about, what, to get into the, to the details of that question and to try to understand how other people had approached it and what I, I had to add to that. So I think you gotta, you've got to break it down, you've got to see what other people have done, um, and you have to be motivated to, to keep looking. You know, it's, it's an old story. I don't know if it's true that Thomas Edison tried hundreds of different types of materials before he found the, the one that made the light bulb work, and, and uh, I think many types of science are sort of like that, that you, you have to look uh, uh, on lots of different um, possibilities before you find the thing that works. How did you react when you heard you'd received the Nobel Prize? Uh, I thought I was being kidded. I didn't think that was likely. What happened was that, um, we, you know, we had, my wife and I had uh, turned our phones off, as we always do when we go to bed, um, not anticipating any such, uh, any such information. And uh, the committee couldn't get in touch with me. They couldn't get in touch with us. They tried our son, who is a doctor, and he says he doesn't take 4.30 a.m. calls. And so he put it on voicemail and went back to sleep. And finally, our daughter, who um, uh, is, uh, uh, is a, also doing medicine in Chicago, uh, heard it on a, um, a, news, a news clip. And she called us and uh, gave us the news. And... You know, it just was you know, very hard to absorb for a while. Um, I didn't expect it to happen, and uh, but I was, of course, very gratified and uh, began to uh, think about what this experience would be like and and how this would be um, how this would change, you know, my career. How does it feel to know that your research has had this lasting impact? 
Well, it's, it's very gratifying that people still read my research. Um, I had a very long period where I wasn't doing academic research, where I was in the, the government, and I still get a lot of people still citing the earlier work, and that's, that's gratifying. And I think the, the, uh, what's best about that is that, not that I have solved some major problem once and for all, but rather that I've been part of the construction of, you know, as the profession as a whole is trying to understand, for example, uh, banking crises or what causes a macroeconomy to, to fall into a depression, that I have been someone who has, you know, put a block in that wall, who has, who's helped build that understanding over time, um, and that the directions that I found interesting and I tried to contribute to, that those directions have been fruitful enough that people are still looking at those uh, approaches. So uh, that, that's, I think, the, the gratifying part is not that you've, you've, you've solved the question once and for all, but rather that you've been part of a professional process where working together directly and indirectly, uh, economists have tried to better understand these really important uh, problems. <laughs>